Okay, well, let's go to, let's come to uh, the, finally, the fall. Uh, long mentioned and now handled in the ninth book of Paradise Lost, Satan having compassed the whole earth and now returning uh, as a mist by night into paradise and entering in the form of the serpent and then the temptation begins. We see how far he has fallen in a sense, how much his being has degenerated in his portrait. He went from the archangel, uh, glorious in his portrait, uh, to uh, uh, be almost unrecognizable even to sin and death, and certainly to Uriel when he first appeared to him, uh, did not recognize him, and uh, became a toad. Now he's a mist, and he'll eventually slide into a serpent's body because the serpent will best be able to disguise him. So there's an interesting use, and this is typical of the poetry in general, of the uh, theological understanding of Satan and his degeneration and the physical representation of Satan and his degeneration, which also represents the moral degeneration of Satan. <coughs> As he gets worse and worse, yet at the outset he boasts that he thinks he's fallen as far as he possibly can fall, and yet uh, Milton makes clear that he that is not the case. Uh, he is losing. The more he opposes God, the more he uh, his being uh, is losing its luster. Which doesn't mean that he has no potency. He he is still able to deceive, but he's losing aspects of his uh, God created nature the privation of his being. So this is consonant with Milton's Augustinian theology, right? We saw it's evil is uh, not a thing unto itself. It is the privatio boni, the privation of the good. He was created by God. He was created good. He rebelled against God at that moment. He uh, Evil was created. When we say created, God is the creator. So God didn't create this. There was a, so what was created was uh, in some ways um, there's a parasite that has emerged and that lives on the host. It's called evil, and evil is spreading like a cancer. Remember, cancerous cells can only survive on the, on, uh, the backs of healthy cells. They don't generate uh, themselves. <coughs> S similarly with Satan. Uh, but we open with a, another invocation, and the invocation here uh, comes because, uh, or departing from what the narrative was just to this point in book seven and eight, where we had Raphael, a sort of divine historian, uh, recounting uh, what God had done historically and telling him the nature of the cosmos. And we, we left off with something of that in a more abstract fashion than the rest of the lecture lectures, but we're going to replace the divine historian Raphael with a human narrator, and the human narrator is Milton himself. Uh, unlike Raphael, he is uh, a fallen man, and therefore a sinner. On the other hand, he has a prophetic role, which makes him akin to Moses, who's going to proclaim the truth. He's going to proclaim the truth which he himself would never be able to have access to as a sinner were it not to revealed uh, to him and all of mankind in the Bible. But let's begin with the invocation of the muse. And I, I simply want to note before I... Um, no, I'll just I'll begin with reading the invocation and um, then comment on it. And it's an, it's an interesting, and the, this is the fourth invocation. We, they were in books one and three and seven and nine. And so if you follow the, um, what we said already, our last class in particular about the uh, symmetry of the book or the organization of it, the first uh, books one and three of the first six books and seven and nine, the second six, are th there's a mirroring going on there. Right? So the second half of Paradise Lost begins with book seven. And then, right? 
So there's a parallelism there. But now he is going to tell, do a rather different invocation. And he is going to, as he say, turn the notes to tragic. So the, I, I talked about the inclusion of different genres within the epic uh, that Milton um, really introduces. So the epic, we, we, throughout the course, we've talked about how Milton was tuning his uh, instrument to be able to write the grand epic. And he did so by uh, trying to master various other literary genres in order to write the grand epic which he, was his life's work. And uh, he hasn't yet written a tragedy. He will write the tragedy after this. Samson Agonistes will come to that. But this is a little mini tragedy within the epic. And you could see parallels perhaps in uh, the story of Dido and Aeneas in, in Virgil, book four of the Aeneid. That's a, sort of a tragedy in miniature. Doesn't have all the marks of a tragedy, but the, the subject matter is tragic. So let me begin with that, and, and Milton begins with th these words, no more of talk where God or angel guest with man, as with his friend, familiar used to sit indulgent, and with him partake rural repast, permitting him the while venial discourse unblamed. I now must change those notes to tragic, foul distrust and breach disloyal on the part of man, revolt and disobedience. On the part of heaven, now alienated, distance and distaste, anger and just rebuke, and judgment given, that brought into this world a world of woe, sin and her shadow, death, and misery, death's harbinger, sad task. Yet argument not less but more heroic than the wrath of stern Achilles on his foe pursued thrice fugitive about Troy wall, or rage of Turnus for Lavinia disespoused, or Neptune's ire, or Juno's, that so long perplexed the Greek and Cytherea's son. If answerable style I can obtain of my celestial patroness, who deigns her nightly visitation unimplored, and dictates to me slumbering, or inspires easy my unpremeditated verse, since first this subject for heroic song pleased me long choosing, and beginning late, not sedulous by nature to indict wars, hitherto the only argument heroic deemed, chief mastery to dissect with long and tedious havoc, fabled knights in battles feigned, the better fortitude of patience and heroic martyrdom unsung, or to describe races and games or tilting furniture emblazoned shields, impresses quaint, caparisons and steeds, bases and tinsel trappings, gorgeous knights at joust and tournament, then marshaled feast served up in a hall with sewers and seneschals, the skill of artifice or office mean, not that which justly gives heroic name to person or to poem. Me of these nor skilled nor studious, Higher argument remains, sufficient of itself to raise that name, unless an age too late, or cold climate, or years damp my intended wing depressed. And much they may, if all be mine, not hers who brings it nightly to my ear. So the invocations themselves are worth the price of admission in Paradise Lost, extraordinary. And so much being said here, uh, first of all, the shift to a uh, tragic tone. Um, he began with the subject matter in the first invocation, if you recall, announcing his theme of man's disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, which brought death into our world and all our woe. And in the third, with hailing heavenly light, remember he's descended down into hell and needs to uh, not only speak of something that will be... Uh, insufferably bright to a sinner, namely the holiness of God, but will he, he'll have the further problem of having just been describing hellish things. So he needs to purge himself of that, and he needs a vision to see things that actually are not visu visibly um, to be seen. He's describing the indescribable, he's describing God, he's a spiritual being. In the seventh, he begins rather differently uh, and talks about Urania, 
and the cosmos, uh, and, and so the, the muse of astronomy, speaking on those because he's about to talk about the, the, the way in which the spheres harmoniously represent God's handiwork, etc., etc. But he needs an inspiration in order to do that. And now finally, the, he invokes the muse for the final time, but this time to finally get to the matter that he announced in the very first invocation and needs to change from the very pleasant conversation with Raphael in which uh, they sit as friends and eat. And now he has to suitably present it in uh, the terms uh, of rebellion, which it is. He will describe that. And uh, it's interesting to note here that he will talk in terms, and I want you to see a crescendo here, and this is observed by Christopher Ricks in his book on Milton's Grand Style in 1963. There's a crescendo of words going from discourse to distrust to disloyal to disobedience to distance and distaste, the alliteration. And they, as each time they build, the, the um, intensity of antagonism between mankind and God brought from the side of man grows. Now God is at enmity with mankind. But note the, the, the alliteration there. Um, and he, and he, he also puts the word heaven where we would expect God to be in it and it inserts get distance in it place where we would expect God we have distance. He's been displaced. What ought to be there and expected has been replaced by distance. That's the choice. Sufficient to have stood though free to fall. He takes the fall. Uh, so he changes this, and, and um, Milton condemns it unequivocally, says that it brought anger and just rebuke and judgment given that brought into this world a world of woe, the terms uh, with which he announced the epic to begin with. And then announces, however, in spite of all that, that the, although the task is sad to recount this to us, it is an argument that is more heroic than any previous epic. Now this is already, this now invites us to consider exactly what the nature of heroism is in Paradise Lost. We, one of the questions is, who is the hero? And, and much ink has been spilt over that question, who is the hero of Paradise Lost? And, and rightly so, but really the, the question is, what is the nature of heroism? And, Milton address, addresses it directly here. It is not worldly heroism. When he speaks of uh, Achilles and thereby the Iliad, or speaks of Turnus and thereby the Aeneid, or Neptune's ire, or Juno's ire, um, he's speaking of the obviously Homer and Virgil here. These had been, and then he said that these perplexed the Greek and the Roman, and thought they thought that martial battles, that is military conflicts, were the fit subject matter for epics, because heroes were, were such figures. Remember that the hero, uh, the name is not just somebody, it actually has meaning in this age. The heroes are demigods. The heroic age is the Bronze Age. We no longer, in, in the days of, uh, of Homer and of Virgil, they don't live in the Bronze Age, they live in the Iron Age. And they're talking about ancient history when, when gods walked the earth, or demigods. So it's an age in the past. And they, it's, they were called heroes, such men. <coughs> but they won uh, through, again, physical battles. And of course, for uh, Milton, he regards the, um, the literal battles to be not physical but spiritual. Now here we get to the literal and the allegorical and almost the inversion of what we mean by literal and allegorical. Milton's account is really a, uh, he reconfigures not only heroism but what we mean by literal truth. The literal truth is one that accords with a spiritual reality. So in Ephesians 6 when Paul says that our enemies are not flesh and blood, but the powers and authorities, the spiritual uh, forces 
uh, he's not actually, um, he's, he's making a literal statement. And there, if, when Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world, he's making a literal statement. And, and Augustine will amplify this in his work, The City of God. So when the Ro city of Rome is destroyed, leveled by the barbarians, uh, Augustine has to account for the fact that the center of the known world, Rome, has fallen to the barbarians, and yet uh, the city of God has not fallen and exists in the midst of, of earthly cities. It, it, it's not that it's totally separate from it, but is distinct from it. So talk, there are two cities, the city of God and the city of man, and the two coexist. But the more important of the two is the city of God. And the embassies, by the way, in the city of God are the churches, which is why they can't be taxed. You can't tax a foreign embassy. And the churches, the buildings that we call churches, as opposed to the people, the ecclesia, the people of God whom we call the church, or the New Testament calls the church, these are, are understood as, as belonging to God, and thereby no foreign power be it Rome or any other, can tax that because it's, it belongs to a different state. And the people of God that belong to that building, the church, or come and gather in that building, they also work within the city and do things that are uh, part of the city of God in the midst of that. Anyway, so he's redefining heroism because he's really, really redefining reality. The real things are the enduring things, the things that do not change. Empires rise and fall. God's word stands forever, and what it affirms does not change. And God does not change. So when he redefines heroism, uh, which he then does here, he will not only distinguish himself from the ancient epics where it is connected with military conquest, um, he will also change the character of the epic hero. Because to some degree, Satan seems like a very good epic hero on one level. He boasts, he will not submit, he endures suffering. The narrative follows him around a fair bit. It begins, in fact, uh, the first two books of the epic are largely devoted to Satan. And in the end, Satan actually also succeeds in his aim, which is to pervert mankind. So it's a pretty good argument that uh, Satan wins, although Milton makes it clear from the outset that he doesn't. But still, just in terms of the, um, the dramatic effect of Paradise Lost, it does seem like Milton Satan is rather heroic. He wants to wage physical battles. And uh, Milton's demonstrated in his portrait of that in books five and six how ridiculous physical battles are to spiritual beings, because they can't be killed anyway. And they you blow a hole in them with cannons and then they come back together and so forth. So it, it, it's ludicrous physical battles for spiritual beings. The nature of heroism is, is thereby redefined in terms of our relationship with God. That's what will mark the hero. The hero is one who's obedient to God and, uh, and, uh, and obeys him. Whereas the anti-hero or the rebel or the um, the world's understanding of heroism will be its antithesis and not pride because oh, the, 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 the fall of Achilles is due to his rage and his pride. Where he's, at the beginning of the Iliad, he's sitting and he's pouting and he won't fight because Agamemnon's taken his girl, his prize. So I'm not going to fight. I'm going to sit here and you can't win without me. And all of that provokes a great loss and in the end Achilles does come out but in we're not supposed to admire Achilles even though he is the hero I think there's something sort of contemptible about Achilles even for Homer and uh, and certainly Virgil's Aeneas is not a very admirable figure he is his hero but I mean he uh, in the the end of the of the Aeneid Aeneas stabs Turnus, who's on his knees begging for mercy, in the heart and kills him, which is a contemptible act. Somebody begging for mercy, you don't kill them in cold blood, which is what he does. 
that's the hero of the Aeneid. But it is the, there is no other hero, that is the hero. But even the pagans recognize that the, uh, the greatest of men, the heroes, actually are not particularly good heroes. Anyway, comment or question? What's a soul? Exactly. Like, I okay. I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, like, um, is it, like, he's damned? So, he's so the answer is, the answer is no. He, he doesn't have a soul? No. Okay. But, but he's a spiritual soul? being. A soul is connected to some degree with the breath of God. He doesn't have the breath of God. He doesn't bear God's image. He doesn't have a soul. But he is a spiritual being. But he, he, his creation is different. He's not made in the image of God, um, which is not to denigrate uh, angels. They are spiritual beings, but they don't actually share the Imago Dei. There's something about mankind that is even greater than the angels. Um, and it's certainly um, the case that, that God um, becomes man. He doesn't become an angel to atone for Satan's and the rebel angel's transgression. Because he expresses psychological torment and distress and so forth. Yeah. That's I'm accommodationist trying, language. I'm trying to like separate, you know, find a distinction between like Mill's idea of the uh, Mill's idea of the soul and like what he's saying about the soul. It's pure invention on Milton's part, right? Pardon? It's it's pure invention on Milton's part. And Milton is casting a character, a quasi-human character, attributing to him speeches and emotions uh, of a of a human being, and and it and he's he's really going out on a limb with it. I mean, Dante sticks Satan in hell, and he doesn't speak at all. He just suffers and crunches the sinners of three three sinners eternally. He's stuck down there, and everything, the deep bottom of hell for. Uh, Dante is, is Satan's anus. That's the bottom of hell uh, for Dante. That's it. It's the, but, but he doesn't speak. He just slavers all day long. That, not, not a speaking being out. Milton gives him a great deal of language. So there's danger in this. And, um, and one of them is, is sympathy for the devil. But I don't think Milton actually expects the audience to be sympathetic because he, he knows that his audience, whether they're... they're uh, his Protestant intended audience, or even the Catholics, they're not going to have sympathy for the devil. It's just, it's inconceivable to him. Like literally inconceivable, not just uh, uh, Princess Bride inconceivable. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't occur to him. So the romantic authors who do see him as a heroic figure have anthropomorphized him too far and are no longer interested in theology and just see it as a literary trope, but they collapse the natural and the supernatural anyway. They think that God is a, a great idea, representing the highest of all ideals and so forth, the sort of thing you hear in the media all the time. You know, the, it's man's search after God, and it's been expressed in various ways in this, various cultures and various times, but um, that, that's what it is. It's a poetic representation of primal human good, which is the exact opposite of what scripture declares. And Milton is with scripture on the portrait. Um, and whether you like it or not, you just have to take that as it is. Uh, there's no reason to doubt Milton's uh, sincerity in seeking to portray it that way. But the, Mil but the romantics certainly did not read him that way. But that's their problem. I think that makes them bad readers. Um, but that's for another class. I'll go after the romantics in romantics class, not in this class. I do enough of that uh, without doing that here. But I think certainly here, uh, when he says that his argument is not less but more heroic, now he really is saying, here's the re re redefinition of heroism. It's not a difference of degree 
which you could say uh, Virgil was to Homer insofar as Rome was greater than Greece in its size and its longevity, etc. It's, it's a difference in kind. It's theologically conceived. But it's not presented in the terms uh, which are highly, uh, are more Christian. Dante's Divine Comedy uses, he, it does fuse classical and Christian uh, ideas without a doubt, but it's presented in a landscape which is totally alien to the ancient world. Whereas this is closer to it, quite frankly. It, 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 it follows more the trajectory of the classical epics in order to act as a foil to them, or the other way around, he would say it. They are anticipations of the true epic, which he's just written. <coughs> so they were speculating on the nature of the underworld. Here is the real underworld. It's called hell. <laughs> and Jesus was the one who termed it that. Right? It's Jesus who talks about the hell more than any other figure in the Bible. So that is it. And his celestial patroness, as opposed to um, Juno or, um, or Venus, she deigns to her nightly visitation on a poet. Note that he calls her a she. This is very odd. The Holy Spirit is a, is a he. What's going on here? Speaking of her in, as, a, as a she. Perhaps wisdom? Although he calls her a patroness. Maybe it's just a, a word. Uh, he has a patron, but this is a female patron, patroness. And she deigns her nightly visitation unimplored and dictates to me some slumbering. I find this hard to accept, actually. Given what I said last class about the structure of Paradise Lost and its, its quite extraordinary timeline and so forth, the, the enormous thought that this just comes to him unimplored and that there's unpremeditated verse. This seems like it's really come on. It's bad enough that you are, uh, it's the most intellectual book that was ever written in some ways, but you claim it's unpremeditated? Give me a break. I, what on earth? You, you've already said that you planned on writing this from early days. What do you mean unpremeditated? Maybe I'm not understanding what he means by the word unpremeditated, but at any rate, and then, and then he goes on to say that, so it can't be that, because since first this subject for heroic song pleased me long choosing and beginning late. At first, as we know from his defense of Secunda, he was going to write on um, Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. He decided not to write on that subject and decided again, to, uh, decided instead to write on, the, on these things. And in part because he th thought it, he was unfit to write on that sort of heroism where, again, knights joust and the one whom God favors wins because he's the most virtuous. Well, Milton no longer thinks that physical battles like that with, that was fought by Cromwell and his armies are the sign of God's favor. At least without some... Um, contradiction at any rate. They have some sort of contradiction. Because remember, Crom Cromwell's Republic has fallen when he has written this. And Milton's under house arrest. So it's not through a physical battle that God grants the victory per se. They may come, but ultimately uh, his victories are never overturned. So he will speak about a spiritual kingdom that has uh, been inaugurated and which will never end. So me of these, nor skilled nor studious, 43, higher argument remains sufficient of itself to raise that name. So what is the heroism? Well, we saw it to some degree uh, back in book one of Paradise Lost. Milt, or Satan said that to be weak is miserable, doing our suffering. To be weak is. And, and yet God himself becomes weak. God himself becomes miserable. And through his suffering, he 
conquer sin and death at the cross. So it's the total uh, contradiction to everything that Satan can even imagine. Milton follows the Bible and calling it grace. But that's her heroism because, of course, the, the greatest figure of all will define what heroism is. It's no longer now a cultural construct. It's, it's what God declares heroism to be. And so I don't think you can improve on Milton's Paradise Lost, if he's correct, which I think he is. So this is the great epic. There will be epics written after it, but they will not. They will have to be compared to this epic. This is the epic. And, uh, and, and in a way, even though it comes after the others, I think it, it and, and it uses its conventions in some ways, it, it, it now interprets heroism rightly. And the muse, the natures of the muse rightly, and the nature of the underworld rightly, and the nature of heaven rightly, and the nature of education rightly. So thereby, it then becomes the epic. I mean, that's his claim. It's, 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 uh, it's extraordinarily bold. Other comments or questions? If not, I would like to move on. Okay. I love that. It's, it's just so good. And, he, and it's consistent with his part. Like, there's a, there is a development of Milton. There's no doubt about it. He finally gets to the point where he writes his epic, etc. But he, there's a consistency in vision with the very first work that we saw, the Ode on the Morn of Christ's Nativity. It's consistent. Back when he's 19, or 21, or whatever age he was when he wrote that. So it is now he's going to turn the new note to tragic and note how it begins. And remember the significance of, uh, of time and space here. The sun was sunk. And after him, the star of Hesperus, whose office is to bring twilight upon the earth, short arbiter twixt day and night. And now from end to end, night's hemisphere had veiled the horizon round. When Satan, who late fled before the threats of Gabriel out of Eden, now improved in meditated fraud and malice, bent on man's destruction. Mulgar, despite what might hap of heavier on himself, knowing that he will suffer for it and lose. This is the, this ex, the extraordinary thing. He's, he is driven by God to some degree to do this, and yet he chooses to do it. So this, this balancing that Milton has between the free will or choices of the characters and God's uh, not only allowance of that, his endorsing of that, but in the case of Satan, he has no free will anymore. Which doesn't mean that he's the cause of the fall. Satan is, and is punished for such, because God is not the author of evil. Otherwise, he is evil. That, that was the subject matter of Book 3, that discussion. But he now goes and fearless returned. By night he fled. Uh, when Judas betrays Jesus in John's gospel, it, uh, so when he gives him, um, the one whom I give this will betray me, Jesus, Judas takes um, the morsel, the privileged morsel from um, Jesus' hand, and he says, go quickly. And he goes out, and John tells us it was night little detail. The light in John's gospel that overcomes the darkness has now given in to darkness, or darkness is now for a time going to overcome the light, just for a time. Pregnant with a moment, that point. So now, he, by night he fled in it, and at midnight returned from compassing the earth, cautious of day, like Gollum. Since Uriel, region of the sun, descried his entrance and forewarned the cherubim that kept their watch, thence full of anguish driven. The space of seven continued nights he rode with darkness. Thrice the equinoctial line he circled. Four times crossed the car of night from pole to pole, traversing each color. On the eighth returned, and on the coast diverse from entrance or cherubic watch by stealth found unsuspected way. There was a place, not, now not, 
though sin, not time, first wrought the change, where Tigris at the foot of paradise into a gulf shot underground, till part rose up a fountain by the tree of life, in with the river sunk. So there is a uh, pictorial depiction here. T.S. Eliot accused Milton of lacking a pictorial imagination. He didn't lack a pictorial imagination. The picture that he was describing is of a world that no longer exists because of sin. But he's describing it for us. He comes up there and he, he's looking for a place in which to get close to Adam and Eve, and he needs to disguise himself. Tries to find one, and he lights upon 87, the serpent, subtlest beast of all the field. Him, after long debate, ir irresolute of thoughts, resolved. His final sentence chose fit vessel, fittest imp of fraud in whom to enter and, at, and his dark suggestions hide from sharpest sight. For in the wily snake, whatever slights, none would suspicious mark. So he moves around. Now note, at this point, he's not slinking on his belly. That will be the punishment for the serpent. At this point, he just, he, I guess he slinks on legs. It's hard to imagine what this looks like. Is it like a dragon? Maybe. It's, a, it's not yet a beast crawling around on its belly, but it is sort of winding its way on legs. On he goes. And then he first, as we say, um, so inhabits the beast, and then uh, resolved, and then let, let's look at the interior monologue here. First from inward grief, line 97, his bursting passion into plaints thus poured. O oh, earth, how like to heaven, if not preferred more justly. This is, by the way, diabolic logic. It's, it's not to be preferred more justly, but it's Satan. Seat worthier of God's, as built with second thoughts. God did it the first time, and then, you know what? He made improvements on it. Reforming what was old. For what God, after better, worse would build? Terrestrial heaven, danced round by other heavens that shine, yet bear their bright, officious lamps. Light above light, for thee alone, as seems, in thee concentrating all their precious beams of sacred influence. So the lights of the firmament, the stars, the sun, etc., are for the, seemingly for the sake of this terrestrial globe. This is an important place. But of course, that's the sunlight. That's not the light of God. In the new heaven and the new earth, there is no more light, because Jesus is the light. Yes? So light above light, height above height, is that sort of theme going on here? Always. Yeah, you, you need it. So Eliot says he lacks a spatial imagination. I think he has an intensely uh, spatial imagination, but he's describing spiritual things that are above descriptions of, of space and time, but still trying to describe it. And we recognize that he is using accommodationist language appropriate to the subject matter, which is something indescribable. Um, and yet when he does that, he's following the model that we see in the letter to the Hebrews, where he's describing the, uh, the temple and the inner workings of it and so forth in terms of being it is an exact copy and, and representation of what is in heaven. Right? And that's why it was very specifically laid down. There's, there's a parallel going on there. Right? So the, the Bible also talks about this. It's an exact copy and representation of it. What does that mean? Because the temple is Jesus' body as well, and it's also the, the, the believers that are like stones in the temple. And so, it, so it gets really hard to understand the multiple levels on which we're supposed to be thinking. But it, it's patent in Scripture, and it's patent here hard to understand, but the analogy is there, and the analogy is, in a sense, the literal understanding. It's where literal and metaphorical seem to unite. So he, he sees this, and then he says, with what delight, speculating, 114, could I have walked thee round, if I could joy in aught, sweet interchange of hill and valley, rivers, woods, and plains, now land, now sea, and shores with forest crown, rocks, dens, and caves. But I in none of these find place or refuge. And the more I see, 
pleasures about me, so much more I feel torment within me. Note the parallelism. As from the hateful siege of contraries. So whatever is good, he's antithetical to it, but there is no such thing as an antithesis to good. Other than hostility here, and hostility is to the creator of the good, that is to God. So again, as I say, he himself is the privatio boni, the privation of the good, and there's, yet there's a hostility, there's a will to defy it. That is the good, and with good, then God. As from the hateful siege of contrary, all good to me becomes bane, and in heaven much worse would be my state, for neither, but neither here seek I, no, nor in heaven to dwell, unless by mastering heaven supreme, nor hope to be myself less miserable by what I seek, but others to make such as I, though thereby worse to me redound. For only in destroying I find ease to my relentless thoughts, and him destroyed, or one to what may work his utter loss, for, for whom all this was made, all this will soon follow, as to him linked in weal or woe. In woe, then, that destruction wide may range. To me shall be the glory soul among the infernal powers. In one day, to have marred what God, he almighty styled six nights and days, continued making. Echoing Lamech. God did, took six, I do it one. God said he will punish Seven times, I'll do it 77 times. I'm greater than he. <clears throat> and who knows how long before I'd been contriving, though perhaps not longer than since I in one night, freed from servitude and glories, well nigh half the angelic name, he repeats the lie. Well, it's almost a half, a third, it's close. And thinner left the throng of his adorers, he to be avenged and to repair his numbers thus impaired, whether such virtue spun of old now failed, more angels to create, if they at least are his created, or despite us more determined to advance into our room, a creature formed to birth. So now he posits the outrageous hypothesis that mankind was created because God lost a bunch of followers so he had to create more. But he already said at the outset that there, they were told that a man had been created uh, or was going to be created before the fall even happened. So this is outright lies and slander. And man he made, 152, and for him built magnificent this world, and earth his seat, him Lord pronounced, and oh, oh, in dignity, subjected to his service angel wings, and flaming ministers to watch and tend their earthly charge. How much worse? The angels serve the new kids on the block. <laughs> so he will creep into the serpent, and I, that I, who erst contended, 163, with gods to sit in the highest, am now constrained into a beast and mixed with bestial slime, this essence to incarnate and in brute, note the spiritual being's distaste for being incarnate in a body. Note the antithesis between that and, and, and Christ's willingness to take on a body. Note the tendency of uh, certain types of spirituality, particularly Gnosticism, to think that the Christian faith has nothing to do with being embodied or acting in bodies. Huge heresy that laps at the church to this day. But the bestial slime that to the height of deity aspired, but what will not ambition and revenge descend to? Who aspires must down as low as high he soared, obnoxious first or last the basis thanks. Revenge at first though sweet, bitter ere long back on itself recoils. Let it, I reck not, so it light well aimed, since higher I fall short on him who next provokes my envy, this new favorite of heaven, this man of clay, son of despite, who must the more to spite his maker raised from dust. Spite then with spite is best repaid. So he's winding himself up, making it all up, giving an excuse for why he's going to uh, pervert mankind and hate mankind, although man has done nothing to him. 
and suggesting that it was, you know, God did it to poke him in the eye. So he's rightly vexed to come back at him. In he goes. Uh, I will oversee, over, skip over a few lines and we'll begin with the discussion between Ad, uh, Adam and Eve. And um, just a brief comment before we do that. Um, the two together are gardening. And in gardening, they are, they are cultivating. And in cultivating, they're doing what they were commanded to do. To bring the earth that has been given and is good under their dominion, and they're supposed to thereby make it better. Now, they're working. Working is not a product of the fall. That's how it was portrayed in the ancient epics. It's a, it's a punishment for the transgression against the gods. Work is. And sex, to some degree, is a, a consequence of a fallen world. Uh, the, the, the biblical view is that both work and sex are good, goods ordained by God. They can be distorted and they can be marked by sin and they, they will become so, but in and of themselves work is a good thing, work for God. Similarly, um, sex, rightly used, is a joyful thing and will bless uh, uh, the, those that uh, use it rightly with, inherit, uh, uh, with children. But the, here's the, and there's a, an element of domestic comedy here still. But uh, we'll pick it up. This Eve first to her husband thus began. Adam, well may we labor till to dress, still to dress this garden, still to tend, plant, herb, and flower, our pleasant task enjoined. But till more hands aid us, the work under our labor grows, luxurious by restraint. What we by day lop overgrown, or prune, or prop, or bind, one night or two with wanton growth derides, tending to wild. We have a problem here. The more we work, the more the plants flourish, right? You chop and prune and it, it, it grows more luxuriant. Thou therefore now advise or hear what to my mind first thoughts present. Let us divide our labors. Le Eve is the first economist. We need to increase our productivity. How about that? Let's divide our labors. Thou where choice leads thee or where most needs, whether to wind the woodbine round this arbor, or direct the clasping ivy where to climb, while I in yonder spring of roses intermixed with myrtle, find what to redress till noon. By the way, the, the, the contrasting pair of plants here, Adam needed only direct the ivy to climb. It's a sort of a married elm to arrive at an emblem of married love. There's an emblem of married love here. And, and honeysuckle or woodbine is similarly associated with, with union. So both of these plant illustrations are symbolic of a, of a right harmony between male and female. So for the while so near each other, thus all day our task we choose, wonder if so near looks intervene and smiles or object new, casual discourse drawn. Oh, look at that thing. I haven't seen that before. What's that, Adam? It's called, and they sit and talk for a while. <laughs> Which intermits our day's work, brought to little, though begun early, and the hour of supper comes unearned. We need something we will stop. We need to separate paths because we're not being productive enough. Too much communication going on here. To whom mild answer, Adam, thus returned. Soul, Eve, associate soul, to me, beyond compare, above all living creatures dear. Lewis, by the way, comments on the portrait of Adam and Eve and says that we need to see the, um, probably the excessively formal addresses here as appropriate to a king and a queen. And note how it begins that way. And the addresses will continue to be rather formal and titular and so forth until they start to have conflict and then they'll drop that. And, and, and it's a good way of illustrating the fact that they are, the tension is building between them. But for now, soul leave associate soul. To me, beyond compare above all living creatures, dear, well hast thou motioned, well thy thoughts employed, how we might best fulfill the work which here God hath assigned us. Nor of me shalt pass unpraised, for nothing lovelier can be found in woman. 
than to study household good. Now it sounds like, geez, it's a 50s bride or something like that, you know, be barefoot and pregnant in the home or something. Household good here is the, uh, the oikos, the home, um, the, um, the uh, productivity of the home. And it's, and it's flourishing. It's not just talking about the procreation of children, it's talking about the Proverbs 31 woman, someone who is busy and makes things uh, more productive, which is, let me tell you, a heck of a task. Not only to manage uh, children, but also to be a, 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 a business person and an educator, because remember, the parents are the educators. So the mother is, an, is also that, and this is household good. So don't associate it with, with uh, vacuuming and dusting and stuff like that. That's not what's meant here. And good works in her husband to promote. Furthermore, yet not so strictly hath our Lord imposed labor as to debar us when we need refreshment, whether food or talk between, food of the mind, or this sweet intercourse of looks and smiles, for smiles from reason flow to brute denied, and are of love the food. Love not the lowest end of human life, for not to irksome toil, but to delight, he made us and delight to reason joined. Now Milton in includes this whole passage here where we have no biblical precedent whatsoever. It's, it's like most of the narrative, he is uh, interposing his own thoughts here in, in terms of a dialogue. Uh, but what he is doing when he is doing this is trying to do what C.S. Lewis does in Paralandra, which is to debunk our assumptions about what an unfallen world must be like. That's what he's doing. He recognizes that misogyny exists between uh, of men towards women and vice versa, misandry. He recognizes that it's part of the fallen world. So the way he needs to debunk that is to present a world without uh, the hints of a fall before the fall happens. His challenge is the fact that he is writing for sinful fallen beings that live in a world that is not marked by these relations. So again, his challenge is as difficult on in paradise as it is to some degree in describing hell and describing heaven. It's a world that nobody's ever seen, save Adam and Eve. So it's hard uh, to read him, you, you really have to read, uh, t try and read him on the terms and conditions that he's presenting it as and think that he's being sincere. If the world were unfallen, what would it look like? Then. So don't do that. He, so he made us and delight to reason join these power, these delight to reason join. So the appetites, the sources of joys, the, the, the passions, are wedded with the will and with reason. They all work in unity. So the things that delight us are reasonable. There's no contradiction there. And we will what's delightful and reasonable. If we're moved by our, our passions, our desires for something, it's gonna be good. It's entirely reasonable. So if we're smiling at one another, that's a good thing. We're moved by the, the appearance of our, our, of our opposite, our complementary opposite. If we smile at that, that's good. Don't be a rationalist. -y. Don't think about it in these terms. Now, the, 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 the very disagreement sounds like it could be a fallen thing, but I don't think it is. It's just a discussion. Again, he's speculating. But there he goes. But he said, um, he made us in delight to reason, join these paths and bowers, doubt not, but our joint hands will keep from wilderness with ease, as wide as we need walk, till younger hands ere long assist us. But if much converse, perhaps the satiate, just a short absence I could yield, for solitude sometimes is best society, and short retirement urges sweet return. But other doubt possesses me, lest harm befall thee severed from me. For thou knowest what hath been warned us, what malicious foe envying our happiness, and of his own despairing, seeks to work us woe and shame by sly assault, and somewhere nigh at hand watches no doubt with greedy hope to find his wish and best advantage, us asunder. Hopeless to circumvent us joined, where each to the other speedy aid might lend at need. Whether his first design be to withdraw our fealty from God or to disturb conjugal love, 
than which perhaps no bliss enjoyed by us excites his envy more. Or this, or worse, leave not the faithful side that gave thee being, still shades thee and protects. The wife where danger or dishonor lurks safest and seemliest by her husband stays, who guards her or with her the worst endures. Okay, his argument's entirely reasonable given the nature of the threat that God has revealed and the angel has acquainted him with. There's a reason why uh, the threat is real. I mean, after all, the angels fell at the hand of Satan. You are therefore under mortal threat. So his, his reasoning is entirely, on one level, uh, reasonable. On the other hand, it's hard not to get the sense that Eve's talk, or Adam's talking down to Eve. Why is that? Is it because he is talking down to her? Is it because we can't conceive of a, a conversation where that isn't a part of the intent, whether stated or not? I, I think the latter. I think it's impossible because when we talk to people, there is that aspect. <coughs> so. Is it a failure on Milton's part? Is it a failure on the reader's part? It might be both, but there is an element of that. At least I think so. And she, and now here's the, so there's a disagreement that arises between them. So you could also say that if there's a disagreement, is a disagreement not a constant, is it not already showing the signs of the fall before the fall? Right? I mean, Milton doesn't think so, clearly. They can disagree. It's, both of them are making a very reasonable case. But there is a sense in which there's already a division that has arisen between them. But as yet, there is no sin in everything. Every choice they make is permissible and good, furthermore. A case can be made. And his case isn't don't do it. It's wrong. It's evil to choose this. It's, it's, it's unwise. It's not prudent given the context. That's the claim. And he gives various reasons why it will be advantageous to him furthermore and not just to her. But Eve doesn't receive it this way. To whom the virgin majesty of Eve as one who loves and some unkindness meets with sweet austere composure thus replied. Unkindness. It's not that Adam's not being nice to her. It's that he is not treating her as his kind. Remember, the kind is mankind. The two together bear the image of God. He's suggesting a difference between the two. Thinking that she is likelier to be subjected to temptation than he. Some unkindness meets and replies, offspring of heaven and earth, and all earth's Lord, that's such an enemy we have who seeks our ruin, both by thee informed I learn, and from the parting angel overheard. So she was eavesdropping. Sorry for the pun. <laughs> As in a shady nook I stood behind, just then returned at shut of evening flowers. But that thou shouldst by firmness therefore doubt to God or thee, because we have a foe may tempt it, I expected not to hear. His violence thou fearst not, being such as we not capable of death or pain, can either not receive or can repel. His fraud is then thy fear, which plain infers thy equal fear that my firm faith and love can by his fraud be shaken or seduced. Thoughts which how found they harbor in thy breast, Adam, misthought of her to thee so dear. He's hurt. Is her response reasonable? Yes, it is. It has to be. Otherwise, it's not dramatically plausible for the two to separate. As again, I say to you in Genesis uh, 3, Adam and Eve are together when the temptation happens. So Adam, uh, Milton separating the two is also an invention. Uh, and it, it raises its problems for Milton. You could argue that he overemphasizes uh, the fallibility of Eve or the susceptibility to temptation. But when he does that, he is actually 
following scripture. So he's got some support. I, I can't even, uh, to me, I, as a fallen being, I, uh, I see men's weakness as clearly and sharply as women's weakness. So I just take it as it is, but I, it doesn't seem like it to me. <clears throat> and furthermore, the, her, intellect in, her intellect in fear, I haven't noticed that myself. In my years in university, women seem as intelligent as men. I just don't see it. Um, take it as take it as stated, but it's not uh, empirically observable per se. At any rate, to whom with healing words? Healing words. Adam replied, "Daughter of God and man, immortal Eve, for such thou art from sin and blame entire, not." diffident of thee do I dissuade thy absent from my sight but to avoid the attempt itself intended by our foe for he who tempts though in vain at least asperses the attempted with dishonor foul and furthermore he adds that if um, he will find himself better fit to repel the temptation if she is present because I, 309, from the influence of thy looks receive access in every virtue. I'll be a better man in your presence. And why would it not be likewise for you? So we're stronger when we're together. He makes a strong case. Why shouldst thou not, why shouldst not thou like sense within thee feel when I am present? And, my, and thy child choose with me, best witness of thy virtue tried. So spake domestic even his care and matrimonial love. But Eve, who thought less attributed to her faith sincere, thus her reply with sweet accent, accent sweet renewed. If this be our condition, thus to dwell in narrow circuit straightened by a foe, there's a loss of freedom. Subtle or violent, we not endued single with like defense wherever met. How are we happy still in fear of harm? But harm precedes not sin, only our foe, tempting, affronts us with his foul esteem of our integrity. His foul esteem sticks no dishonor on our front, but turns foul on himself, when wherefore shunned or feared by us, who rather double honor gain from his surmise prove false. Find peace within, favor from heaven, our witness from the event. And what is faith, love, virtue, unassayed, alone, without exterior help sustained? This is God's argument why he created them free. She's using God's own uh, language back at Adam. That's why the temptation, that, why there is a tree there, why they can disobey. They have freedom. And if she's going to be constrained out of fear, then Eden is no Eden. She'll say this. Let us not then suspect our happy state left so imperfect by the maker wise as not secured a single or combined. Frail is our happiness if this be so, and Eden were no Eden thus exposed. Eden means pleasure. Delight. And yet there's all delight in Eden. Everything's good. But she's just pinned him. This is a wrestling match. She just pinned him to the floor. He's done. It's good. She's used God's own argument against him. So again, for all of the... Uh, and Milton, when he suggests that Eve in some ways is his intellectual inferior, demonstrates that what he means that is hard to comprehend because I think Eve actually beats him in the argument. So what do we make of that? And Eve's arguments, I mean, gosh, this uh, Eve is quite extraordinary. To whom thus Adam fervently replied, O oh, woman! <laughs> Sorry, I interjected my sinful human male response to irritation because she is actually a woman. A woman, but how do you imagine the dialogue without a little bit of tension there? Best are all things as the will of God ordained them. His creating hand, nothing imperfect or deficient left of all that he created, much less man, or aught that might his happy state secure. Secure from outward force. Within himself the danger lies, yet lies within his power. Against his will, he can receive no harm. But God left free the will. For what obeys reason is free, and reason he made right. 
but bid her well beware and still erect, lest by some fair appearing good, surprised she dictate false and misinform the will to do what God expressly hath forbid. So not then mistrust, but tender love and joy. Okay, so he repeats what God has said. Both of them are. Don't even lay yourself open to the temptation. You don't need to do that. If you want to approve your constancy, 367, approve first thy obedience. If you obey, then you'll prove yourself to be constant. You don't have to seek temptation. The other who can know, not seeing the attempted who attest. But if thou think, trial unsought may find us both secure, then thus warned thou seemst, go, for thy stay not free absents thee more. Go in thy native innocence, rely on what thou hast of virtue, summon all, for God towards thee hath done his part, do thine. So he tells her to go because he's not going to coerce or compel her. Again, the understanding of love here. He's given his argument. He's followed God's argument. And he allows her the choice. So spake the patriarch of mankind, but Eve persisted, yet submissed. The last replied, with thy permission then. So off he goes. Off she goes. And goes at noon, uh, and they will return rather at noon. And then Milton's comment before the fall, uh, foreshadowing, oh, much deceived, much failing, hapless Eve, of thy presumed return, event perverse, thou never from that hour in paradise founds either sweet repast or sound repose, such ambush hid, hid among sweet flowers and shades, weighted with hellish rancor imminent to intercept thy way or send thee back to spoiled of innocence, of faith, of bliss. For now and since first break of dawn, the fiend, mere serpent in appearance, forth was come, and on his quest, where likeliest he might find the whole included, the, the only two of mankind, but in them the whole included race, his purpose prey. In bower and field he sought, where any tuft of grove or garden plot more pleasant lay. But he sought them both, but wished his hap might find, 422, Eve separate. He wished, but not with hope, of what so seldom chance, when to his wish, beyond his hope, Eve separate he spies. Uh, this is a wonderful passage. Veiled in a cloud of fragrance. Note the parallelism throughout the passage. Veiled in a cloud of fragrance where she stood, half spied, so thick the roses blushing round about her glowed, oft stooping to support each flower of tender, slender stalk. I Remember, roses fall over because it, so she is using, um, um, she's propping them up. Whose head, though gay, carnation, purple, azure, or specked with gold, hung drooping, unsustained, them she upstays gently with myrtle band, mindless the while herself though fairest unsupported flower from her best prop so far and storm so nigh. Wonderful. Two flowers. She's in the midst of the roses. She's propping up the roses. She's Adam's rose and she is unpropped and the storm is coming. Down he goes and he now weaves himself voluble and bold speaking going back and forth and he starts playing with Eve and gets her attention, and then begins his temptation. But, <coughs> and uh, he, he becomes, just for a moment, and I'm gonna skip over this because I'm running out of time, because I think it's an extraordinary passage. He sees her, her heavenly form, 457, angelic but more soft and feminine, her graceful innocence, her every air of gesture or least action overawed his malice and with rapine sweet bereaved his fierceness of the fierce intent it brought that space the evil one abstracted stood from his own evil and for the time remained stupidly good he's stupefied he can't act on his evil he he's he's not good either He's good in so far as he exists, but he, he's, his intent is, is almost thwarted by Eve's extraordinary graceful innocence. He stood, 
stupidly good, of enmity disarmed, of guile, of hate, of envy, of revenge. But the hot hell that always in him burns, though in mid-heaven, soon ended his delight and tortures him now more, the more he sees of pleasure not for him ordained. Then soon fierce hate he recollects and all his thoughts of mischief. And so we get the interior monologue uh, of uh, Satan and his thoughts, and he, he gathers himself together, and then he begins the temptation. And now he, he is enclosed in the serpent. He comes at her uh, in various descriptions to classical serpents, uh, Cadmus, 506, and Hermione, and various other um, uh, allusions given there. And he comes, and again, at uh, like a beast at Circean call. Remember Circe, the one who turned man into beast, so uh, malevolent imagery. And then he speaks to her finally after he she pays attention to him, 532. Wonder not, sovereign mistress, if perhaps thou canst, who art soul wonder, much less arm the lo thy looks the heaven of mildness with disdain, displeased that I approach thee thus, and gaze and say shit. I thus single, nor have feared thy awful brow, more awful thus retired. Fairest resemblance of thy maker fair. Thee all things living gaze on, all things thine by gift, and thy celestial beauty adore with ravishment beheld. There best beheld were universally admired, but here, in this enclosure wild, these beasts among beholders rude and shallow to discern, half what in thee is fair, one man except, who sees thee, and what is one, who should be seen a goddess among gods, adored and served by angels numberless, thy daily train. Note that the uh, Satan sounds like a courtly love poet, comparing evil, Eve rather, to angelic beings, a goddess. He's over-egging the pudding, he's overstating the case. And she will respond in kind, thy overpraising. Is her right? She's, he's overstating it. On the other hand, um, um, his case is that not is twofold. One, she's in the midst of beasts, and she's superior to the beasts. There's only one man. Secondly, she ought. She's more beautiful and fair in some ways than what is in heaven and therefore belongs there. Both of them are anticipations about what he will soon offer her as a beast to become like a god. She rejects it immediately, but it sinks in. There's something true in it, just some, enough. Uh, Milton's comment and the comments by Milton are, are really helpful because they're describing what we won't see which is we don't get internal monologue from Eve at this point and we don't get it in scripture in general actually either we get speeches so Milton will tell us what's going on inside the heart of Eve as a description the same way the Bible will do we don't get extended reflections of what she's thinking he tells us what she's thinking in a short summary statement. So glozed the tempter, and his proem tuned into the heart of Eve, his words made way, though at the voice much marveling. At length, not unamazed, she thus in answer spake. I want to draw your attention to this word, amazed. She's not unamazed, she's confused. Puzzled, of course. It's a beast speaking to her. She didn't think that was possible even. And furthermore, she, there's a flattery here in it. It, it's amazed her a bit. She's shocked. She in answer spoke, what may this mean? Language of man ex pronounced by tongue of brute and human sense expressed. The first, at least of these, I thought denied to beasts, whom God on their creation day created mute to all articulate sound. Articulate sound are things that point to things. You identify it with, they can cry and they make all sorts of different noises, but they can't actually identify it through words, things. The latter, that is human sense, I demur for in their looks much reason and in their action oft appears. The serpent, subtlest beast of all the field I knew, but not with human voice indeed, redouble then the miracle. How came this so? And then he tells her, and then I used to be like this. 
And then eventually I worked my way to a tree and the tree was so wonderful to look at and wonderful to taste. I took the thing and I ate it and nothing, I ate nothing like it in my entire life. And then he observed 599, strange alteration in me to degree of reason in my inward powers. And speech wanted not long, though to this shape retained. Thenceforth to speculations higher deep I turned my thoughts and with capacious mind considered all things visible in heaven or earth or middle, all things fair and good, but all that fair and good in thy divine semblance and in thy beauty's heavenly ray, united I beheld. No, no fair to thine equivalent or second, which compelled me thus, though importune perhaps to come and gaze and worship thee of right declared sovereign of creatures, universal dame. So the eating of the tree brings Satan or the serpent, rather, up the chain of being. He becomes, it, it's had this effect. Now he speaks like a man, and he reasons like a man, and can contemplate the things that a man can, even though he appears like this. And she will do likewise. The effect will be similar, is his suggestion. So talk the spirited sly snake, and Eve, yet more amazed, unwary, thus replied. Serpent, thy overpraising leaves in doubt the virtue of that fruit. In thee first proved, but say, where grows this tree? Takes her there. Lead that. Takes her there. We'll have to pick it up next time, but 647. Serpent, we might have spared our coming hither, fruitless to me. Though fruit be here to excess the credit of whose virtue rest with thee, wondrous indeed if cause of such effects. But of this tree we may not taste nor touch. God so commanded and left that commanded, sole daughter of his voice, the rest we live law to ourselves, our reason is our law. Okay, note that she repeats what is there in scripture that they may not taste or touch, which is not God's prohibition. A, a prohibition has been added, they may not eat of it. She says that they might not touch it either, which is not true. God did not say that. A little extra rule. It's almost the sin before the sin. A little extra prohibition. There's the Ten Commandments. Here's the Eleventh. Won't touch it either. Is this sin before sin happens? No. <laughs> but it's deviated ever so slightly from what God has commanded. Where did she hear this? Not from God. From Adam then? I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I'll have to pick it up next time and then we will carry on uh, with it. But I will return to book nine and uh, we will then move on to the next book. <laughs>